also up here. Yeah, keep it short. I'll keep it short, sir. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Fritzi. Uh, I'm a vice president at the Potomac Institute for uh, Policy Studies. We're a, a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, uh, independent think tank uh, working s and uh, policy issues. I run the Vital Center, which is a, a center, an academic center that we have inside the Potomac Institute for uh, critical infrastructure and supply chain security, a topic that I'm sure everyone here is certainly very interested in and a topic that's extreme, extremely uh, hot these days. Um, we have been doing a series of workshops where we're doing outreach to, uh, to build a community of stakeholders of, uh, that are involved in critical supply chain security issues. What we want is to bring together diverse people from diverse industries, not just the DOD, who have similar skin in the game, who have similar concerns, and see what kinds of issues and problems exist in those areas. We've had some earlier, and, and learn from one another. The important thing is to learn from another, so we're going to have a lot of time for, for questions, and, uh, questions and answers. Um, Previous, for instance, uh, previous topics, uh, we, were, uh, worked, we were in finance. We had a nice talk uh, from NCSC on the threat, threat space um, and uh, what the finance world is, is uh, thinking. And, and uh, um, actually, another talk from Melissa Hathaway on, on uh, the threat space as well. We're gonna, we have a very interesting uh, panel today uh, covering uh, government, uh, ranging from government through uh, a couple of industries, including um, the energy grid. Uh, industry and uh, pharma. So that's another example where there's a life and death issue involved here. So I'm, I'm certainly very excited to see what I can learn from the, the speakers here. And uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you are as well. Um, I would like to give uh, General Al Gray a chance to make a few remarks, sir, if, you, if you'd like. I, I'll make them later. You'll make them later? Okay. Well, fantastic. Turn it over to so then I will turn it over to the CEO of the Potomac Institute, Mike Swetnam, who is going to give some high-level comments because uh, he actually uh, gave birth to the Vital Center and uh, maybe explain about what uh, the strategic purpose of, uh, of Vital is. So Mike. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you all for participating in uh, another uh, seminar here at the Institute. As you know, and as Mike just said, our role is to be a part of uh, creating and fostering a discussion on how science and technology can inform our society and our political structure in addressing critical issues of our national security. So it's our pleasure to have you here. But as Mike said a minute ago, the most important thing are your thoughts and your views and your comments and your input. Uh, you will enrich what we're trying to do by your presence, but even more importantly, by your contribution. So thank you in advance. I really do appreciate it. Uh, the vital and infrastructure are really, really, really old issues that we're kind of uh, trying to resuscitate, if you will, or bring a new life to here at the Potomac Institute. And the concept is that the definition of the term infrastructure and what is critical infrastructure has changed. That most of us probably don't really think about it a lot or realize it, but what we mean by our, the infrastructure, the things we rely on to make our society work is vastly different than it was decades ago when we defined critical infrastructure and we put in place lots of regulations and laws to ensure that our critical infrastructure was protected and available for our country and for our national security. We believe at the Potomac Institute that it's time to rethink those concepts, resuscitate them, give them new vitality, if you will, to use the term vital as a center that we've created, uh, around the concept of what infrastructure means in 2020. A little, a little side story, uh, if you'll give me just a second, because uh, now I'm semi-retired and I spend part of my time in Hawaii, so I get to tell a Hawaiian stories every time I'm uh, at a microphone. So this is your uh, penance from coming to a seminar where I get to kick it off. In my uh, leisure in Hawaii, a friend of mine and I created a company to, of all things, produce salad dressing, Hawaiian-based salad dressing from Hawaii. And it was all based around the idea that in today's world, because of globalization and what globalization really means, 
we challenged ourselves. Now, he's a technologist. He sold a company that made stereo speakers, and I'm a think tank guy. We challenged ourselves to create a company, to create something that we knew nothing about, and make it a global company selling merchandise globally without opening a factory, an office, or hiring a bunch of workers. The premise is that globalization will allow us to be the creators, the innovators, the entrepreneurs who come up with the idea, and then we could do it all on the infrastructure that globalization has brought us. Almost three years later, the company is very profitable. It has no employees. We operate out of the back room of a bar in Hanalei, Kauai. Um, we outsource the bottling to a company in Honolulu, uh, a combination of Amazon and FedEx and a few other people deliver our stuff all around the world. And I have a global company that was created totally virtually. The point of all that story is not to tell you about my salad dressing, although it's really good stuff. <laughs> look, up, look up the Kauai salad dressing company and I highly recommend it. But the point of that is that we are able to do that. In fact, commerce around the world operates today because there is an infrastructure out there that did not exist 30 years ago. It's not an infrastructure of factories. It's not an infrastructure of boats and warehouses that I own. It's a global infrastructure based on an IT backbone, which I think is extremely critical to our society. That's a different infrastructure than we talked about in 1945 or 1955 or even 1995. And how we address, protect, guard, make available that infrastructure is the issue of what VITAL and this seminar is all about. We need to redefine the term, rethink what it means, and bring to the table new ideas for protecting what we now are relying on at a level that a few of us could even understand. So with that, I hope you'll join me in welcoming uh, the panel that we brought together today. We're trying very hard to reach out to the various parts of industry and government to bring together the best thinkers, the deepest thinkers we can find. The last seminar was on 5G, and the publication is just now becoming available. We're trying to address all the issues we can find out there. And as I said, finding the most thoughtful people is a critical and a valid and a most important first step. So I am extremely excited today to have uh, with us uh, a good friend of mine. I'm very happy to be able to call her that. She might argue the point, but I think she's a very good friend. Uh, Dr. Joy Purser, who's been in town for, she's been, in, you've only been in town for a decade and a half and you've had an impact of, of decades. This is the type of person that Potomac Institute and others think the nation needs. She is a PhD in uh, microbiology, a hardcore technologist who has spent many years on the Hill working for a number of members on various issues, science, technology, health-related issues. She got hired into DOD to help them do a budget and capability analysis. And in recognition of the impact and her wisdom, not long after spending a little time in DOD, she found herself OMB as the, the national security analyst on the OMB budget staff, which is uh, in the vagary of Washington, D.C., one of the most powerful and influential positions you can have, and I think a real compliment to the capability that, that she brings to Washington, D.C. Uh, those of us that followed what she did there were very, very impressed with the impacts that she had, and uh, all of us watched closely what was going to happen after that because half of the world wanted to hire her. She ended up back in DOD and is now the deputy of the capabilities analysis group CAPE in DOD. You DOD people know what CAPE means. Uh, the, if, if, you're, if you really have your act together, you love CAPE. If you don't, you, you shy away from the mere, mere mention of who they are because mm -hmm. they come to the door. Uh, Joy now is the technologist and 
the mind and the spirit behind what's going on in DOD analysis today. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce her as our keynote speaker today. General, Mr. Swetnam, and Dr. Fritzi, colleagues, thank you very, very much uh, for being here today. It's my delight to speak to you. Welcome to the Potomac Institute seminar on global supply chain. What do we mean when we say supply chain? It's a brief question that entails a very long answer. First of all, the defense supply chain does not necessarily mean only military. It encompasses dealings of the Department of Defense, the Department of Homeland Security, the intelligence community, and many other aspects of uh, our national security apparatus. It also includes civilian critical infrastructure, both public and private. Today, we focus our discussions on the supply chain. Simply stated, the supply chain is the sequence of individuals and activities that make things for the end user. For this, I rely on my experience working within the Office of Management and Budget recently, where I served as the Defense Industrial Base Examiner for OMB. The scale of what we know as the defense supply chain is immense and of a complexity beyond any of our full understanding. A publicly available chart illustrating the global production of the Joint Strike Fighter indicates a nearly countless number of discrete, discrete places that JSF is designed, made, and tested. I counted eight partner nations, 86 different overseas locations. Most of them are in the European Command area of responsibility, but not all. And in the U.S., I counted 60 different places involved in JSF production. It is becoming more and more challenging to trace the origin and chain of custody of every part that goes into a system, whether that system is a GPS satellite, a tank, a submarine, or a pharmaceutical product. We don't expect military operators with the many personal sacrifices they make and the burden of their duty to know all of the steps encompassed in making the material that they use. Should someone? Their lives depend on a robust and secure supply chain. I don't have answers to the dilemma, but I can offer this. The issue of the defense supply chain has captured the interest and the attention of decision makers both in the White House and within the U.S. Congress. When I began my detail at OMB last summer, the President had signed Executive Order 13806, which directed an assessment of the defense industrial base. The assessment, which has not yet been publicly released, was extensive. Led by the Department of Defense in close collaboration with other agencies, such as the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Industry and Security, as well as the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It explored major areas of the defense industrial supply chain and evaluated their fragility. Of course, microelectronics were a highlighted sector in the analysis, underscoring how important this supply chain is to the Defense Department and others. The Government Accountability Office published a report this June entitled Defense Industrial Base, Integrating Existing, existing Supplier Data and Addressing Workfor Workforce Challenges Could Improve Risk Analysis. The GAO report gave examples of industrial base risks that could impede DOD's ability to obtain products at the time, quantity, and quality needed. These risk factors included single source, foreign dependence, obsolete items, capacity limitations, or specialized equipment or requirements. The GAO listed electronics, specifically integrated circuits, as one of the nine crucial industrial sectors for the Defense Department. 
The report highlighted the difficulty faced by DOD manufacturing and industrial-based policy, MIBP, really the U.S. government in total in assessing risk at the lower tier supplier level due to the level of sensitivity and proprietary information. The National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 20 was signed into law on August 13th and it contains several key signals on this topic. One, Section 321 authorizes the use of working capital funds for minor construction related to defense industrial base facilities. And two, subtitle E is called industrial base matters. It contains eight items ranging from procurement limitations to another report on the electronics industrial base. Clearly, the nature of global commerce and policies that attempt to protect and bolster the American supply chain are generating complex second order effects. The Defense Department can take zero risk when it comes to obtaining trustworthy parts for military equipment. There are no easy solutions to the government's challenge to mitigate risk to a fragile supply chain. I am, however, optimistic that there are many dedicated people, both government servants and commercial sector leaders, who are thinking, discussing, and working out possible solutions. Isn't it a paradox that some of our government's biggest challenges rely on systems that are very, very small? Thank you for your attention. So I think what I'd like to do is uh, maybe leave the questions once we hear the remarks from all of the panelists here, because that way it's more interactive and then we sort of don't have something that focuses on any one particular set of, uh, yeah, can, the mic's on, right? You can hear me. Okay. I'd like to actually do the Q&A after we hear from all the panelists. So let me actually remind myself of who's next on the, on the list here. Dr. Tushar Misra. Yes. We're actually very happy to have a, a representative from the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Um, we realized for some time our, our in-depth studies we've done at Potomac have been very heavily government and DOD focused. And of course they involve life or death. When you're involving military platform or military mission, you know, supply chain matters a lot because it's life or death issue. There's a life or death issue in pharmaceuticals as well. And so this is exactly the point of vital is to learn from the industries that have a similar interest and a similar um, pr uh, problem set in many ways to what the government and the DOD has. So I'm, I'm tickled that uh, um, Dr. Mishra uh, accepted the, our, our, our invitation to speak, and I'm really interested in hearing what he has to say about the supply chain challenges and, and issues in the, in the pharmaceutical industry. So with that, uh, Dr. Mishra. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I had a set of slides prepared, but uh, going through our legal department for uh, <laughs> bearing, I c probably it's easier to cure cancer than uh, <laughs> to get my slides. But they are in review, and I was told that by next week uh, they would, you know, either let me release them or they're fairly de-identified, so they're fairly innocuous. But uh, if but if that happens, then I will actually send a copy. Uh, as a follow-up, as a post-meeting follow-up that you can uh, publish. Thank you. But I will, what I will do is, as I'm going through, there are a couple of uh, public uh, <coughs> documents that you can easily access that really talks about this issue as well. Uh, so when we look at supply chain, clearly there's an e economic factor, but more importantly, there's a safety factor. <coughs> We deal with oncology medications. Now, oncology medications by nature are really focused on a fairly small subset of the population. Most cancers, as we know, are, are uh, <coughs> effect, while they affect a fairly uh, a substantial section of the population, in, in the grand scheme of things, they're still fairly small. And you're treating a, uh, a condition which could be chronic, which means you, your patient's taking it for years, or it could be something acute. 
And because of the level of uh, rigor that's required to develop these medications, they are rather expensive. So these become great easy targets for diversion, for uh, counterfeiting, for, for many other uh, uh, sort of a actions, uh, illegal actions that I'll, I'll talk about. And for us, it's not so much the, the economic impact, at least that's not how at least the company that I work for, that's not how we see it. We see it as really d impacting patients' lives. For me, the success of a um, supply chain is ensuring that when a patient shows up at a infusion center or a clinic or a hospital, they better have that vial waiting for them. There's nothing more important than that because for them, they don't really care what my problems are. They for them, they are expecting that vial to be there. And that vial better be, as required by the FDA, safe, efficacious, and unadulterated. How do you ensure that? Because if you're looking at a liquid, all liquids look the same. It's a nice, clear look, uh, liquid like w water. It's, our, it's the security measures we put in place. It's uh, the analytical methods we put in place, it's the safeguards we put in place in terms of supply chain, in terms of being able to trace in, in, in order to provide traceability. That's what, in the end, gives us assurance uh, that this product is safe. So what are the common risk factors? The problem is not every, most, I would say, U.S. and most of the Western European countries have really good regulatory oversight and enforcement. Uh, but there, but a great part of the uh, uh, greater part of the country, the 186 countries that we uh, market our product in, have poor enforcement. The regulatory over regulatory oversight is weak. Illicit trade via the internet, across borders, and then access to affordable, quality, uh, safe, effective medical products is also not there for the general populace. The standard of governances are low ranging from either poor ethical practices, where even doctors are in on the game, so to speak, uh, and to corruption in both the public and the private sectors. And then, of course, the tools and the technical capacity to ensure good practices in manufacturing and quality control and distribution are limited. They are much more advanced in, you know, in, in sort of the first world countries, but as you move away into uh, the poorer areas. So, for example, this paper that you can look at later. It's the it's titled Prevalence and Estimated Economic Burden of Substandard and Falsified Medicines in Low and Middle Income Countries. It's a JAMA, the General American uh, Medical Association uh, Network Open. But it talks about the fact that almost 20 percent, 20 percent of the drugs in these countries are adulterated. And the cost to the population, 10 to 200 billion, anywhere in that range. It's hard to but it's not so much the cost, it's what it does because when you take substandard medications, let's say for example antibiotics, it actually starts to create resistance because you're taking substandard, subpotent antibiotics and instead of curing the disease actually starts to <coughs> generate, um, um, you know, <coughs> bacteria or, 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 or microbes that are now resistant to the very medication. So you have these superbugs. <coughs> For us, the, our internal challenges are very complex supply chain because of what we make. The, exist, the expertise doesn't always sit in the U.S. We make our products all over the world and then assemble them at one place. So again, you have to think about how do you move across borders, uh, what are the, systems, what are the uh, uh, systems you can put in place to make sure there isn't diversion. So, and then as we expand into emerging markets, because there is a need. So most of, uh, for example, we have something called an ATM program, an access to medicine program, where we give free medications. Uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, the company I work for, does give medications to uh, some African countries. It's based on a sort of needs program. They have to go through a certain um, bar to qualify, but they're given um, uh, oncology medications for free. So what are the common definitions? That, so one is counterfeit, which is basically it's spurious, it's mislabeled, deliberately mislabeled. 
then there is diversion. So legitimate pharmaceutical product is produced and intended for sale in one market, but then illegally either intercepted and sold in another market or through the collusion of agents in various countries, they are diver diverted. And then, of course, there is outright theft. So we've had cases where a truck was stopped. This happened in Brazil several times, where our, our trucks were st stopped because they clearly identified Takeda, were stopped, and the product was pilfered and, and was gone, you know, basically. Uh, it was a heist. So what are the global industry trends for counterfeit products? We're looking to, and the, uh, the government obviously uh, and the FDA have already instituted um, requirements like serialization, for example, so that you now you can trace a, a end product, you know, a vial or a tablet that you're holding in your hand to where it was, where it was started, what was the active ingredient, where was it made, and all the way down the chain. So you can basically start to test the system at various points and say, Okay, where is this possi possibility happening? Also, the box itself, tamper-proof uh, or tamper-evidence seals, uh, 2D or 3D barcodes. We're, we're starting to get through, and now they're to the point where we're looking at technologies where at the end, uh, at the end of the supply chain, a person can, um, has a, say, an app on his phone, and they can actually scan the barcode, and it'll tell them because it, barcodes are also easy to, uh, to copy and make. But we've got uh, various um, so technologies built in with a 3D barcode so that it's not that easy to copy. And then the app tells you whether it's uh, the real thing or not. So th there's const the thing is, when you come up with a s solution, there's already somebody who's already trying to outthink that and, and a step ahead. It's so it's that constant battle. Um, for us, the big problem is diversion. We haven't seen as much counterfeiting as diversion. Countries that are most susceptible to diversion at the moment, and I'm not singling those countries out, at least for our products, is Turkey and Greece. So we see all these products from Turkey and Greece ending up showing up in either mostly Eastern European countries or back into the Western European countries. But they have to have collusion with certain pharmacies who are willing to then sell those. So, for example, only yesterday I, I received a, a NTM, which is a, what we call a notification to management, saying a spurious vial was discovered in Colombia, right? But when we traced it, the product was actually supposed to be sold in Greece. How the hell did it make all the way to Colombia? And then we have to now, we have we've asked for the vial, we have to now bring it back, test it to find out if it's the real thing or if it's just water, because that's what happens <coughs> is these are vials, and you can easily, through some scale, peel back the, the stopper and, you know, take out the real stuff and put water in. So there's a certain callousness to that uh, act, which says, I don't care what happens to the patient. I'm just going to make money off it, because these are thousands of dollars. And then, of course, theft. Theft w will happen, and again, it's really uh, the respect for the law, uh, the ability to essentially enforce those uh, uh, rules that can prevent that, but that's not going to happen when you have other systems breaking down in that society. And so this is a way to, for them to make money. <coughs> These are some of the key global industry stands. Uh, so for us, focusing on counterfeits is not so much an issue, but in other pharma industry, the these are the types of products where we see uh, enormous number of uh, uh, counterfeiting. Antibiotics and painkillers, 29% uh, sort of, we've seen, uh, um, this is, I'm talking within the U.S. 29 states are reporting counterfeiting in, in uh, anesthetics and painkillers. Antibiotics, 45. Cancer medicines, 19. Diabetes, not as much but heart medicines, 22. It, these, generally, the counterfeiting depends, correlates somewhat to the cost. You always go after the, you know, the biggest bang for the buck in terms of wh whether you can make the money. And also how easy it is to, if it's a simple molecule, sometimes it's easier to, to, to do that. 
Um, the, the, the problem is the incidence of counterfeiting of these medicines has gone up by about 25% in the last four or five years. So clearly, um, there is now uh, you know, almost a concerted effort within a certain group of in, even industry or companies who are just going to make money because they see that there is value in making money off of this counterfeiting crop. Then, of course, we're talking, so we are focusing on that, but we're also focusing on diversion. What happens with diversion is when you have a manufacturer, you've got distributors, then you have your primary wholesale. From the primary wholesale is where the first uh, if, uh, uh, incident of, uh, of diversion can happen. Because as they're making it through the supply chain, you can have a parallel wholesaler who either has access to the product and they start to grab the product, repackage it, and sell it somewhere else. The danger is that they may be selling it in a country which actually has not approved the product. So the patients are basically heard about, oh, I have this, I have this disease. I can't find the medication in my country because my regulatory agencies have not approved it. I'm going to go look for it elsewhere. And through that chain, they're able to say, oh, no, 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 we can get it to you, but it's under the table, it's this cost, plus you have no idea whether it's counterfeit or not. So these are some of the challenges we deal with in preventing diversion, in making sure getting, it's getting to the patient that for which the regulatory agency of that country has approved it for its citizens. Because what happens is not every product or not every molecule that you take will act the same way because some products, we actually, when we do testing, we have to te test it in Caucasians. We have to test it in African Americans. We have to test it in Japanese. We have to test it in various other races because sometimes, depending on your genetic makeup, a medicine can affect you in a different way. So the dosage might be different. So for example, in the US, we have a certain product that may be uh, of a certain range, may have three doses, two, five, and 10 milligrams. When we take it to Japan because of the body mass index and various other genetic factors, we actually have to make it at maybe one, four, and seven. The maximum dose is different. But a, a counterfeiter is not going to worry about that. They're just going to, they want to make the money. So they'll, they'll do any way they can. So those are, these are some of the things we deal with. <coughs> so um, for us, when we look at maintaining supply chain integrity, how am I doing on time? Yeah, <coughs> you can sort of wrap up Lap in up. the next few minutes. Yeah. What we look at is gap analysis to detect risk of vulnerabilities. We look through the entire supply chain. We carefully select supply chain partners. Again, there's a lot of due diligence on looking at their security systems. And then we simplify the supply chain to reduce the risk. Then we develop really good contract language with our partners. Language that has some teeth to it that can be enforced, that has consequences. If they do violate this, then either they lose the business or punitive damages. And then we audit, very frequent audits, to make sure that they are holding to what they said they would do. And then, of, co of course, brand protection, like I've talked about, serialization uh, uh, and, and other technologies. Um, and of course, we have mitigation strategies for upstream, for, for manufacturing, for transportation, warehousing. Um, and get, again, hopefully, um, if, if I'm able to send you these slides, you can, at your own leisure, actually uh, dive into and see um, any, any uh, uh, details that you might want. So finally, what we found is collaboration. So there are other um, Institutes like the RX360, that's a, it's an industry course consortium that is, is based on, it's, it's bent on assuring quality and authenticity of the products. There is a ASOP, which is Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies, again. PSI, a Pharmaceutical Security Institute. IFPMA, International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. And then IACC, International Anti-Counterfeiting, a Counterfeiting Coalition. So there are uh, uh, institutes or there are actual uh, bodies that we can go to and liaise with in, in order to help us develop uh, our supply chain. So m we are not the only ones that do it. 
most pharma companies are a, either in consortium with the, with these the companies or have contracts developed. Finally, um, conc in concluding, the key drivers are for, for breakdown of security is lack of enforcement, weak penalties, corruption, profitability, low risk and ease, and the problem continues to grow. The internet, internet is a huge driver. In fact, in the U.S., the internet is responsible for almost 25% of all illegal medicine sold, counterfeit medicine. All, and all products in all therapeutic areas have been counterfeited, so there is a need to take a holistic risk-based approach. Uh, and I think it's a shared responsibility, working with either internal functions and external agencies, organizations, and supply chain partners. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. I'm looking forward to uh, getting into the discussion and probing a little bit deeper on some of the uh, issues that you brought up. Um, I'd like to move on to the next uh, uh, panelist speaker. Uh, actually, uh, Chris Nissen uh, was, uh, I first met him at a SCORE workshop, I believe, from the na uh, NCSC and found that they, there's actually a major supply chain effort inside MITRE, which I didn't know, which was actually good. It's good to go to meetings and learn these things. So we had a lot of common interests and we had a lot of discussions and uh, um, we, he was kind enough to come here today to talk about some in-depth stuff, in-depth studies that he's done with um, uh, involving the electric grid. I do have to mention that uh, the recent report, um, Deliver on Compromise, that, that he's the primary author on, which I'm sure many of you have either heard about or, or will hear about, about acquisition, uh, uh, supply chain security in, in the acquisition process. So I had to do a little shout out on that one, a little advertising. You can pay me later. You can pay me later. <laughs> so anyway, with that, uh, Chris Nissen from MITRE. Thank you. I'm going to give a little bit um, uh, different talk, starting from some of the motivations and strategy for why we're even here talking about supply chain, and then work on through some of the fundamentals and get into uh, the energy industry and end with some things that I would do if I were actually in the ener energy industry. I'm here talking to you because I'm the director of Asymmetric Threat Response at, at MITRE, which is a nonprofit, works in the national interest. We have seven FFRDCs. I work across those FFRDCs. And about three and a half years ago, I strategically started working with uh, private energy sector in a technology application I'll talk about, um, recognizing that um, you know, it really came out of a study we were doing and it w for the Defense Department and it recognized that it really is the future of warfare, um, really is a home game as much as it is an away game. And a couple more weeks into the study, I realized, and it's really as much about the private sector um, as, it is, as it is any U.S. government interest. So it'll tie in nicely with some of the comments I heard. I sh I'm sure the general um, would agree with me um, that, that the post-World War II era at the beginning of the Cold War was much, much more strategic um, in our line of thinking, certainly from a um, globalization standpoint, projection of Western power than it is today. And I think we're coming back. So I'm going to walk, one of the, rec one of the uh, realizations we had is that um, we had an era of nuclear deterrence um, that immediately you know, kind of kicked off and epitomized the Cold War. And it took us a few decades to build that deterrence. Um, and, um, but it, it was there and it had a set of characteristics, like a secure defense industrial base, projection of Western values across the world. Uh, the general talked about, you know, being in Japan during occupied Japan, you know. Um, that, was, that was, you know, really a projection of Western values. Um, and that deterrence is eroding somewhat today. Um, we're just not making the investments maybe that our adversaries are. Um, but it then, in turn, was followed by an era of conventional deterrence. Again, took us a few decades to build that up. It's not what it was in even Operation Desert Storm um, uh, today, um, but it was so strong. Our you know, the Pentagon used to call it overmatch. Um, our overmatch and our conventional deterrence was so strong that our nation state adversaries began to make a strategic decision to not take us on kinetically. 
And I argue that they'd made that decision to take us on what we term asymmetrically. So we find ourselves, and you can pick a date, you could, it could be, you know, the OPM breach, it could be just a little bit before, um, but we are now at the dawn and in the midst of an asymmetric era for which we have no comprehensive deterrence. So why would they be attacking? Why would our adversaries um, be trying to influence the population of the United States or getting into our energy infrastructure or our man manufacturing in infrastructure? or getting into the F-35, or getting into this weapon system. You can open the paper up only, almost any day of the week, almost any week, um, and find another capability that's been compromised. It's because it's much easier to do that than it is to actually engage mm -hmm. us kinetically. And that's a really powerful, potent point, and it's not by accident. It's part of a concerted strategy. So the North Star here has to be what? Comprehensive deterrence for asymmetric actions. That we're not going to do in one palm cycle. We're not going to do in one election cycle. It's, I hate to say it, it's going to take us a few decades to get there. But we need to start and we need to understand. And if you think about it in that context, now even if I'm completely in the private sector and I have nothing to do with the United States government, I begin to understand, hey, I'm a target. My role in that target could be anything from they want to steal my intellectual property to I'm responsible for a type of critical infrastructure. Maybe it's one of the 16 formally defined ones, like moving information. Maybe it's moving money. Maybe it's moving energy. Um, maybe it's the logistical systems behind the pharmaceutical industry over there. Um, but I could become a target, and it may be to hurt national security indirectly, or, it may, or, or directly, or maybe indirectly by by doing something that corrupts my stock price and, and lowers me down, and now a foreign entity can come in and own that part of the market. So that's the big picture. Another piece of that big picture, um, we're here talking about supply chain. How do our adversaries view their ability to um, uh, exercise um, their operations against us, especially technical operations? We hear everything about cyber IT, cyber IT, cyber IT, and that is a major attack vector. But in reality, in the, in the intelligence community, you know, it's been well known for a long time, and you can go read about it. They really use what's called a blended operation. And that the, common, the, the highest level access points of that blended operation are supply chain, which I'll simply define as software, hardware, and services. A lot of people don't talk about services. Um, cyber OT, or operational technology, I'll define that a little bit. That's what our energy systems run on. That's what the manufacturing systems run on. That's what our weapon systems are. There are any system that has real-time deadlines that have to be met. There's cyber OT, IT, which we're all familiar with, and then there's a the human element. So if you're only watching cyber IT, you're only seeing a part of that operation in time and space because the reality is they come in and out of these as access and opportunities allow. And, and the final result will appear in one of them, um, but they move in and out of all of them. So what has been ignored in all this as we've built up this cyber IT capability is supply chain and cyber OT. So like I said, OT is anything with a real-time deadline. That's a hard problem to fix because we don't have the technology today to do it at scale and mass. We can't use encryption, we can't use authentication. This is a real problem in the aircraft industry, it's a real problem in the energy industry because when you tell that switch it needs to flip, it has to flip at a certain time. And just like um, the, um, well, let me back up then. So then in supply, and so I put, we put a lot of our energy into studying supply chain in this context and cyber OT in this context. Both of those are critically important to the energy industry. As a matter of fact, for those of you familiar with the energy industry, there's NERC, uh, there's FERC, which is the Federal Energy, energy Regulatory Commission, that's a government entity, NERC, um, National Electric Reliability Corporation, which is privately run, um, and there's uh, NERC Institute SIP standards. There's a new set, set of SIP standards, came out a while ago, just for supply chain. Um, so how does, this, how does this tie in to deliver on compromise? The United States military and the United States government has exactly these same kind of challenges. We have weapon systems. We have manufacturing systems. 
um, and deliver on compromise while being written for Department of Defense primarily. You can scratch out DOD and put in USG. And there's some key points in here that's really um, uh, key to know. And, and I offer them as a part of you know, our recommendation for how we all view supply chain. Um, first of all, we acquire systems. We acquire capabilities. We, again, in supply chain, software, hardware, services. We contract with, with contractors and service people. How often is security part of that award decision? Just about never. It's cost and schedule and performance. So the fundamental tenet of deliver on compromise, and if you want a copy of it, you can just Google MITRE space deliver on compromise. The PDF is out there. It's uh, unlimited distribution. Is we all, in government and in industry, need to make security on par with cost and schedule. It won't be free. You know, I, I, I say to DOD, I would rather have 90 F-35s that aren't compromised and can do their mission anytime, anywhere, than 110 that can't. And that cost difference is how we pay for it. But whether I'm DOD or I'm at the Department of Education or I'm uh, an energy industry company, um, I should start to have that same kind of mindset because what we're fundamentally saying is that because of asymmetric warfare, there is, in this asymmetric era, there's a hidden operational risk. You as a CEO today, cannot get away, <laughs> your shareholders won't get you, get let you get away without um, doing due diligence in cyber IT. And I think the time is quickly coming when you have to do the same thing in the digital integrity in your, in your supply chain spaces. Um, there's a couple of uh, key elements to deliver on compromise uh, that I, I could go through, um, but, but really the key, one of the other key ones is the, the um, the critical role that industry plays, which again is why I started working with the, with the energy industry. Um, and we need to move from a, a posture of compliance to one of them owning the problem with us. We need to incentivize them to do that. Um, this is an insidious widespread problem. And although I'm not an expansionist, I believe it needs to be addressed with liability protections and tax incentives. Um, that moves them way beyond, hey, I checked the box on the NIST standards from the cyber space, and we're developing those sa standards in the supply chain space. Um, so how does this apply to the en en energy industry? Well, the SIP standards that came out um, really do hit software integrity and authenticity, regulating vendor access, information system planning, vendor risk management, cyber incidents reporting, a good start. Um, Tends to tend to be in the Defense Department, I think, is heading toward there in with these recommendations, but it doesn't c get to the next step, and that is going beyond a, a posture of compliance and one is to and and of one of working the problem with us. Another important aspect to think of the to think of this complicated space that I'm kind of laying out is we break it into technology, policy, and legislation, right? So the reason we do that is if you're the owner of a company. If you're a United States government agency, you can handle policy and technology with the stroke of the CEO's pen. You can apply technical solutions, you can change your policies for information sharing, whatever. But the legislative piece is really critical. We as a nation are, are struggling against largely socialistic adversaries who have recognized how to work the seams of government and our democracy and our morals, and they know exactly how to, how, to, how to work that space in between the public and the private sector and what our legal authorities are. So we need the Congress, and somebody said, um, the Congress is very, very interested in this problem today, and that's absolutely true. Um, I've, I've noticed a definite turn there. So, so what would I do if I were in the energy industry today? Because I think I've got like three minutes. Um, a, a, key, a key recommendation in, in the report, um, and it's for all systems, is that everything we've been talking about, this global economy for a salad dressing company that has no employees, um, is all based on tremendous technical advantages and advancements that are all fragile. We have built fragility into our systems like you can't imagine when you live in the world I live in. Um, and you would be surprised if we were to actually enter in a, into a kinetic war, how quickly we could be blind. Um, and this is what, you know, is really troubling us as a nation. Um, if we couldn't move money, if you couldn't move energy. So we need to figure out ways, how do we still have the economic advantages of these highly fragile systems, 
yet still have fail-safe backstops to them. We need to drive in our fundamental system engineering, just like Amazon Web Services do. You know, they've got redundancy and backstops so that when you drop something in your shopping basket, you know, they've got redundancy at the board level, the rack level, the, the regional level, the, the city level, the regional level, the continent level. Um, we need to think like that and, and really start engineering systems differently. If I were in the energy industry, I would, I would, independ I would uh, develop an independence um, for my generation plants from ISOs. So um, one of the unintended consequences of deregulation of the energy industry is the ability to move in in energy over long distances. It didn't used to be that way. It used to be you built your generation where you needed it. And as soon as we deregulated it, if I want to build generation, where am I going to go? I'm going to go where the resource is cheap <laughs> and land is cheap. So, I'd, so roughly speaking, a lot of the generation is in the center of the country, all the, most of the consumption is on the sides, on the, on the coast. So we've got these long distances that we need to traverse. Um, and hence, the generation now are told by regional managers, come up, come down, come up to this level, go down to that level. What if this gets corrupt? What if that's not there? You know, so my advice to the energy industry is think about that, that ISO telling you when to come up or down as a supply chain. It's something that is in your operation, day-to-day -day operations, and what do you do if it disappears? And a lot of people's eyes really open up. Backstop your communications. You know, a lot of people, um, they, they use uh, uh, cell phones or they have uh, satellite phones. If you're really in a bad situation, um, telecommunications and, and, and satellites can disappear. So what do you do? There's a fair number of uh, ones out west, anyways, that are moving to HF communications that you know, fit in your, uh, fit in your uh, dashboard of your truck. Um, identify risk, not threats. And then risk is a function of threat, threat, vulnerability, and consequence. There's a lot of people talk about the threat. The vulnerability only you can determine. The consequence is, in Tushar's world, you know, is the vial there or not? And the energy industry is, can we regain control of the system or not in a reasonable amount of time? Is it failure or is it fixable? And anything in your systems that is in the failure state, do what you need to do to have a backup way to get it into the, into the fixable state. Um, the other thing that we really need and what we're pushing for here is visibility into our supply chain. Um, there's a whole set of reasons why that's hard. Uh, some technical, some legal. Contract privacy can get into it. Uh, some of it is just that they are very, very complex. Um, but there's an industry out there starting to grow um, where I think uh, the C-suites are starting to realize that we do have hidden operational risk and we need to discover that more because uh, risk is not good for, um, for any industry. Um, and just two more. Um, oftentimes when we find um, that we've been exploited in one manner or another, it, we, we discover it's been going on for some time, like three to five years. Um, so storage is cheap, so I would recommend um, that you store and record, record and store all OT and IT traffic um, and keep that for three or four or five years. You'd be, that, you'd be surprised how valuable that is. We've got a program um, at MITRE that we're working where we're, where we're working in partnership with the energy, a couple of energy providers. And we've got like 30 te terabytes of data collected and we're doing machine learning and large scale um, uh, analytics on that. The future of intelligence in this, in this space is in the private sector, right? And the reason I say that is because supply chain attacks are pretty much zero day and even the nature of cyber attacks is moving to be boundaryless and signatureless, which means the value that the government can pose to you is decreasing in time. And that means that the detection of those threats is going to be sitting out in infrastructure that's trying to operate a daily business out there, whether it's energy or anything else. So that's why we're involved, to try to help them detect those threats early on. Um, and it's particularly in the energy industry, there's a move afoot because of the economics to move their uh, communication systems that talk to their OT systems into the cloud. Uh, that's a scary thought. Economically, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but, you know, in the DOD, we have, or U.S. government contracting, we have access to something called FedRAMP, which is a little bit more secure cloud. 
Um, but you got to be in the dib to get that. Um, so, you know, this move, again, risk, threat, vulnerability, consequence, when you're thinking about the cost advantage to do, doing something like move to the cloud, it's not fair to just use the obvious. You have to start thinking about what are the hidden costs and how do we go after those. So I'm a little bit over, so I'll have to be quiet. That's fine, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So um, at this point, I'd like, before we go into the question and answer session, I, I just, I want to, I want to take the opportunity to, to thank the person who's done pretty much nearly all the heavy lifting for this, uh, for this event, and that's Miss Chloe Height in the back. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you've interacted with her a lot, and, and there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in getting something like this together and, and the products that come out of it. So we... Yes, yeah, there's a lot of infrastructure that's involved, and so we have critical, we have critical infrastructure here at Potomac. So, um, so I, just came, I just came from AFWorks, from, a, uh, from a, a tech accelerator for that the Air Force uses in Las Vegas. So what they would do at this stage where we have questions and answers is everyone takes their ties off and their jackets, and they pass out Nerf footballs and stuff like that, and then you start think. Well, we need more toys for, like, the Crest Sessions, Mike. Re I mean, it's amazing how your juices flow when you have, like, Play-Doh in your hand. You know, it's just, it was, it was awesome. Um, so a lot of interesting topics, and, and I wrote a couple of pages for but you don't want to hear just from me. So uh, questions for, for our panel. This, this, is where, this, is, this is why you came for this part. And if you raise your hand, I can bring you the mic. So Peggy, and wait till the mic. Uh, my name is Peggy Evans. I'm a senior fellow here at the Institute. And Joy, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what is the best means by which the federal government and OMB being a key player here can look at problems across appropriate bills, across components within OMB, and across agencies to really uh, ensure that any given budget is most effective against the problem? In, in the late uh, 1990s when I was at OMB, we actually did run cross-cutting director's reports on critical infrastructure protection, counterterrorism, and counterproliferation. And I understand that that's no longer a practice, and I wonder what you would advise if you could wave a wand at OMB. <laughs> sure. Thank you for the question, Peggy. And I would just say that, um, you know, with every new administration, there's a new OMB, and OMB's role and responsibility has evolved a lot over time. You know, when I started the detail, I read this book about OMB, and it was, wasn't the same place that I experienced and observed while I was there. Um, there is, however, a lot of cross-cutting work that occurs there, and in my observation, OMB does have a lot of uh, the matrixing or crosstalk between the different divisions. And there also is a very firm belief that the responsibility of OMB is to ensure good management across the government. So microelectronics was a particular focus area for me as the defense technology examiner because A, it's a very expensive problem to try and resolve, uh, and B, it's not only Department of Defense's problem, it's others as well, other uh, agencies as well. So that required me to work not only with the OMB examiner, uh, for Department of Energy or other agencies within the federal government, but also um, agency officials. And so I would uh, invite them to come to OMB and brief me on programmatics. And literally, I would ask, and there's someone here who was part of that group, I would say, you know, what are you doing? What is your program? Uh, who are you working with and how much are you, are you spending? And uh, not only was I doing it for my own education as the examiner, because I'm supposed to be smart on those programs, but I found that the group also uh, seemed to become, well, was collaborative. And there was a genuine interest among the public servants there to collaborate with each other. And so I think that that's a central function of the executive office of the president. Um, you may know OMB is the biggest entity within the EOP. Hmm. Um, Maybe you didn't know, but well, I just <laughs> learned something. It yeah. is, and um, and of course the politics change over time. But the uh, the the federal staff, and I am one of those, a federal employee, uh, are supposed to just gather the facts. 
and try and, um, and foment the best operating uh, federal government that they can and then report that up to political leadership for guidance. So in my experience, there was a good bit uh, of, of crosstalk among the agencies in microelectronics. I assume that occurs in other sectors, but I don't know because my experience was narrowly focused on defense technology topics. Um, but, I, but I had a very good experience there and so I'm optimistic. I, I would say from a moderator to be able to put in a, a word edgewise, it, there's always a problem is, is there one belly button that you can touch? And, and it isn't often the case. In fact, it's usually not the case in the government that there's one belly button on a subject, and that makes it pretty hard, right, to coordinate things. Well, and we also found that with the Congress, it's a particularly difficult because of the different authorizing committees. So we basically determined that DOD was, was the biggest player and the biggest stakeholder for trusted microelectronics at the advanced nodes. And so therefore, DOD should basically have the lead position in terms of programmatics, but that the other uh, federal agencies would be closely knit together with them. And we tried to encourage that. And we also um, did outreach formal and informal with the congressional committees that were um, that were affected. And if you've worked at OMB before, you know that the, uh, the lower level employees are told not to, to talk to Congress, but yet they do. And that <laughs> there is often goodness in that. <laughs> it was a, a quick way we could get fired at DARPA for doing that. But anyway. Exactly. <laughs> but so, yeah, m questions. There were some in the back. Yes. Uh, Bob McClellan, I'm with Micron Semiconductors. So you can imagine we're right in the bullseye. Um, this is to uh, Chris. Um, I actually read your report. <laughs> Fully, you know, I marked it all up, got lots of questions, but I'll probably start with an easy one first, but it's also very fundamental. You mentioned the term fragility, and, uh, you know, I'd like you to define that because, you know, like Nassim Tlaib had his own definition of fragility in his book, Anti-Fragile. Yeah, and, I uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'd like to get a, f uh, you know, foundational definition there on fragility of our systems, right? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that as I just sit here as an extemporaneously, you know, address you. You know, I would really like to engage on that. But if you if you read Talib's book, then then you you get exactly what I'm at, okay. right? So I'm wh what we all and and I don't think we're ever gonna get for our large-scale systems to where Tlaib went. For those of you who haven't read it, he, you know, uh, author of The Black Swan, anti-fragile systems that, that um, uh, benefit from, from stressors or disorder, right? So he's got robust a rock um, or glass that, that is fragile and cracks under stress. In his, in his uh, and he come from derivatives of risk management, right? So what he ultimately says is, um, you know, you, we want to design systems that get stronger as they get stressed, not weaker. Um, so I think, you know, the way I'm, I don't have a formal definition written here, but the way I'm thinking of it is any system that with a little bit of stress can quickly um, become, in, in this, you know, for defense, but say, non-mission ready or critical infrastructure, um, that's, that's pretty fragile. Now, you could say over the timeline, right? So one could argue, wow, you know, a hurricane can do a lot of damage to an energy system, and it's amazing how quickly we bring it back. But there's other systems where for a very short amount of time, all you have to do is delay a message, and the result is catastrophic. So, um, you know, that would be my original approach. But if you're reading to leave, I think you get exactly what we Okay, what we just want to make Mission sure. Mission readiness. Yeah, yeah, just want to make sure I was on the same sheet of music. But yeah kind of commentary, but I would like response if I could. Uh, just thoughts that I have. Um, I don't even know how to really ask the question and or present the comment, but in just uh, simplistic terms, I don't see representatives of the federal government literally knocking on industry's door and giving them an idea of how deep the problem is with the threat. You know, particularly in the supply chain. You know, if you if you just picture in your own mind a target and it's got a bullseye and that bullseye is the weapon system, right? Nobody's looking way out here, you know, where a simple, you know, intentional yeah. 
calibration, e you know, tweak sets you off a millimeter and, you know, a millimeter going from 25 meters to here, I'm still going to hit my target a click and a half away. Yeah. I'm going to miss by yeah, multiple that. feet, right? Um, what I'm really trying to say is, and I'm probably everybody already feels this way, that's why they're here. Industry doesn't know, at least not in the spaces that I walk. Yeah. They don't know what you're really concerned with. Uh, I'm looking at Dr. McCants here, <laughs> partly, you know, so I, I'm really looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I don't want this to become just DU. Yeah, no need to apologize. That's, that's actually a great question. Carl McCants, I'm the technical director of the supply chain director at National Counterintelligence Security Center. It's happening more. And part of the reason that I was brought on was to deal specifically in the microelectronic space. So um, those discussions are beginning. And I would argue, yes, yeah, so writ large across all systems, um, private and public. Um, I actually know of some places where industry knows more than government does. Um, there's other, you know, I think a, a, a good example where government knew more and, and only recently said something was with binding operational order 17-1 um, on Kaspersky that came out of DHS. That was the first time we kind of put that in the public and warned all the citizens, hey, could be bad, right? So, okay, you know, maybe there was reasons for that. Um, but there's also areas, where especially with some of the big defense contractors, where I think they're way ahead of us. And in other industries, they're way ahead of us. So it, it really depends. I get what you're saying, right? We're talking high-level strategy, high-level objectives. The talk I was trying to give today is targeting it and tailoring it for the energy industry. That's a tough industry. You know, they are motivated by CapEx, not OpEx, tax incentives that what they need are engineers, and they need knowledge workers to come in and help them fix their problems. Yet our whole incentive structure for them is buy turnkey big iron solutions and amortize it over 20 years, right? So they're working on thin margins and just, hey, we've kept the light on for 20 years, we'll keep it on another 20. They don't recognize necessarily, some of them really do, others don't or they don't have the resources. So. The, the, the line of thinking there is you are a target, whether you're in the government or not, depending on how you fit, that's all. Um, yeah, if we want to talk you know, very sophisticated weapon systems, that, that's a whole different discussion, and there's a lot of talks going on around town on DU that we can take those up. It does. I mean, one thing, and I wanted to, if we get to ask each other questions, I, you know, I would like to ask you. Well, let, let's exhaust the audience first. Well, so. but to his point, though, one thing I didn't get to say is one of the trends in industrial manufacturing is just-in-time manufacturing, right? So what we're doing at the PLC layer, so in ICS systems and OT systems, there's only four layers, right? There's sensors and actuators, programmable logic control, human-machine interface, and SCADA, you know? But, but... You know, so the, the, uh, an aircraft, for instance, the, the, the avionic system is the, is the PLC, the sensors and actuators are the flight control surfaces, the HMI is the cockpit. To his point, so for manufacturing, that PLC system is now getting jacked right in to a global internet. This is what SAP is doing, right? It's a German cloud, and they're tying that back to the point of sale. And in real time, there are companies changing the way they're manufacturing goods real time autonomously saying, oh, over in this market, they're buying, you know, T-shirts that have a deeper, dif deeper, deeper red. That sold better. So let's start manufacturing more of those. Walmart does this, right? Depending on what's going out at the door at Walmart, that's going back to the manufacturers that provide Walmart. Walmart's not ordering snow shovels, right? So this, we're building fragility into that network because where is your data going? And what if you're doing the opposite? What if my, my goal is to subvert that and, and you're mixing a, an, a drug or you're mixing an alloy? And I want to change the mixture because that same PLC is controlling a furnace, it's controlling a mixer, it's a controlling injection. So there's where it really starts to get hairy. And that's to, that's to both of your points, I think, that does industry know that? 
the, the guys on the manufacturing line probably don't recognize the threat that they're, that they're, the risk that they're accepting when they jack into that. And that's what we're trying to raise, raise, raise awareness of. I would argue, though, the more we make them aware of that, it's in their self-interest to help defend against it. Right? That's I, why I would, uh, I, I, if, I, if I might be yeah. contrary, <laughs> I, I would claim what? You're never contrary, Mike. Me? You're never contrary. <laughs> that, that identifying innovation as in just-in-time manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as a potential new threat or a new target is one way of looking at it. But another systems analyst could look at it and say, the more flexibility I put into my manufacturing system, the more resilience and resiliency I've built into the entire system. And so you really need to take a much larger, broader view. And it might be that the additional resilience that and flexibility you built into the system far surpasses the fact that you added new threat vectors. I yeah, so I'm glad you actually raised that question because I don't mean I don't want to look at this as the sky is falling and counterintelligence drives the world. There are economic there are economic reasons to do all those. I shouldn't have used the word threat. What I meant was you may be t you are taking on unknown risk. That risk may be zero, <laughs> but you're taking on unknown risk. It could be part of a larger system of systems approach. You know, if he has ten different factories and they're using two different just-in-time manufacturing systems, now you can do some interesting ways of statistically sampling the goods and saying, am I being taken advantage of? I'm not at all saying don't build an intelligent vehicle highway system because it'd be easy to subvert or don't hook into SAP networks. I'm just saying that there's risk there and, and the private sector isn't necessarily aware of some of the risks yeah, that we my, are. My counterpoint to that was that, that it's not a glass Unless, unless it's a single point of failure. So, so. Uh, we, we, the fact that I added in more flexible manufacturing equally diminishes the single threat vulnerability of any one thing. So I think it's just wrong to say I create a new flexible manufacturing thing and it's added so much more flexibility. Oh, because that's a single point of failure. Well, it's only a single point of failure no. for that one no. manufacturer. No. Yeah. It's a debate. So over here on the left side. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, the great insights. I'm Dr. Mani from Penn State University, working supply chain risk management, and it's a question common to all the panelists as well as anyone who has uh, information in this. A lot of times we talk about the need to share information when you think of collaboration with partners, of threats, of vulnerabilities, of ways to fix it. But very rarely do we actually do it. It almost seems like a public good. We are ready to take information from a system, but very rarely proactively put into it. Mm -hmm. And I was asked this question by actually somebody from the DIB saying, how do you make sure that the person who's putting in information about a threat 
a counterfeit part or a counterfeit drug or a vulnerability is not penalized for it when he comes up for s as a supplier to the DOD or to a company? How, is, how do you make sure that that proactive measure that's been taken doesn't turn back and bite him? It's uh, um, one quick comment. That's actually a really difficult challenge. I mean, the government had a program called GUIDEP, which you probably know, right, that, that was less successful than hope because of that exact reason. But, but I, I didn't want to answer it. I wanted to give the panelists a Actually, answer. but just as a follow-up to that, when we had a survey on the services, 70% of them said we take information from GUIDEP to inform our risk assessment, but only 20% said when they find a pr problem, they'll report back to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, any, are there any thoughts from the panel about uh, trying to motivate that, or is that, is that an effective mechanism, the sort of, should I say, self-reporting or, or re reporting uh, repositories? Is that an effective mechanism in your industry? Is so that used in your industry? In the pharma industry, yes. Uh, it's obviously um, the responsibility of the individual company because we control our products. We make the products, we're the innovator and we're responsible for all the licensing. So as, um, so we may have something called a field alert, field alert where you uh, inform the, uh, uh, the, the FDA that there is uh, a spurious product that is going, uh, you know, has been released into the market. We have other um, reporting requirements. However, it, it goes to um, the question is sort of central point, which is, is there collaboration? I think it's maybe starting because I think m most companies are realizing we're not all in it for ourselves. We have, if we, if we um, get ourselves together, perhaps we can uh, develop better solutions. So there is now, like I, I, I talked about, uh, there are a couple of um, bodies like the RX360 or, or uh, Alliance for uh, Safe Online Pharmacies or even uh, um, the uh, Pharmaceutical Security Institute, where companies are coming in and pooling together their ideas, their resources to develop a holistic solution to prevent counterfeiting or, or, or uh, diversion or, or uh, theft. Um, but, it's, it's, but it's only a solution that they can propose. There is still the other part of the government in terms of enforcement. That's not gonna, companies are, are not, uh, uh, um, don't have the authority to enforce laws. So it, it's how you work with the local governments, how you work with the local uh, law enforcement agencies. It's easier to do that in societies where uh, the rule of law is respected. Well, so, but, uh, but I think the other question is too, what, you know, the, the motivation, are people motivated to actually report in this way or, or are, they, are they afraid to report in this way? For Not in the of farm the industry, I don't think there is a fear. Uh, at least when, in, at least in terms of, unless you have some sort of vested interest where if you report you're, you're fine found out, then you know, you've got your source of income taken away. In general, we don't find uh, sort of that uh, fear for the whistleblower mentality. So th that, that isn't there. Oh, that's, good, that's good to hear because the, the, the DOD has struggled with the, with the reporting repository. They've struggled with that. Meg. That's why I asked, I wanted to see what the farm experience was. Good. Um, Yes, question. I'm Gladys White from Georgetown University, and my question is for Dr. Misra. I wonder if you could comment on the development and dissemination of flu vaccine and whether or not that substance is as subject to counterfeit collusion and outright theft, theft as other pharmaceuticals. Uh, that's a great question, and I'll, I'll give you a recent example. So there was a um, very recent, I think maybe two months ago, where there, uh, there was discovered that there was uh, a massive amount of counterfeiting and subpotent uh, um, vaccine products in China. In fact, the China, the Chinese government, in 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 some ways reacted so. Uh, I think in some ways reacted in such a strong fashion that what they did was they essentially said, we're not going to be buying from our own local companies anymore. Wow. <laughs> Holy smokes. We believe in products coming in from uh, out of outside of China. There is, so if you take one step back, most uh, emerging countries like Brazil, China, India, Russia, are now saying, if you want to sell your product in my country, you have to help me make that product my country. 
It's a way of generating jobs, a way of bringing in technology, bringing in know-how. Now, some of it is, some of it is just uh, 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 window dressing. You take a vial and you just slap a package on it. That's called manufacturing. <laughs> but they're moving slowly up the supply chain to the point where they are now saying, uh, in order to, for you to make product and sell it in my um, country, you have to actually make the active ingredient. Now, that is really moving upstream, which means you have to provide technology and there is chances of now IP theft and all of that. So it's a very complex situation. So it has happened, and it happened in China. Now, uh, Takeda Pharmaceuticals, which is a Japanese company, has, was, uh, again, this is bioterrorism and security, was contacted by the Japanese government and said, you will set up a vaccine manufacturing program within Takeda. We'll pay you lots of money, but you will set up a manufacturing. And what they do is that site, massive, only goes online for three months. They go over three months, they produce the flu vaccine, they produce the measles vaccine, they produce other vaccines, and they shut down. But it's only because Japan government says, we, in case of an epidemic, in case of some sort of pandemic, when borders will shut down, people will stop flying, products won't flow across, we better have our own supply chain hmm. of vaccines. It's resiliency, right? Yeah, resiliency. It is resilience. Yeah. US, the, the BARDA has the same thing. In the U.S., we have our own vaccines program. So, any—I don't want to mean to be alarmist, but anything can be counterproductive. It's how now things like vaccines, things like biologics, which require living systems to manufacture, are much more difficult to counterfeit. Something like a synthetic molecule, which is just a combination of chemi chemical reaction between several simple chemicals to give you a, a final entity, is probably within the capabilities and reach of a of a, a reasonably good chemist okay. right but biological systems are much more uh, difficult <laughs> to to counterfeit but it has happened it's happened in China it has happened in Brazil it has happened in India that's that, that uh, fascinating uh, coming from the DoD perspective right we all we always wonder what what capabilities does the government need to have a backup for that it just can't lose if something happens so th I'm fascinated by that from, from Parma. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, wha please wait for the mic. Okay. So I have a couple questions. So f first could of all, you, could you introduce yourself first, please? Uh, Lucas Truex is, is my name. So what, I've done, done some work in ICS security, did some critical infrastructure, infrastructure stuff before. And what, what I think the first thing that's striking to me, and it, I don't know, I don't want to talk more so than ask questions, but it, the discussion seems to be centered around flexibility and reliability versus, where in ICS we talk a lot about consequences versus reliability. So not necessarily that the system needs to be available, but it, it, there are con serious consequences, including loss of life should the system go down. So I think it's an important distinction between that CIA triad that we talk about a lot is, yes, I understand the system needs to be up and making money or printing new T-shirts that are different color, but at the same time, if some of these systems go down, there's a real consequence to these, uh, for example, Four or five years ago, they, um, there's a public search engine called Shodan where you can see find these PLCs, open access to things on the internet. And many dams had their HMIs to control the wa water releases for these dams publicly exposed to the internet. So I mean, that's a huge risk. I mean, yeah, you can have it available all day long, but if I can open up those valves and trigger a water release at my discretion, that's a, that's a pretty big issue that doesn't have anything to do with availability. So I think that's that's interesting to me. So I, I'm curious about how, from a policy perspective. How do we balance that? Okay, we need flexibility. We need to, to compete with other militaries. We need to keep it, keep talking about this near peer threat of other militaries. How, how do we balance that flexibility for access and innovation against this things that maybe maybe there are these things that should never be or should have flexibility considered in a in a uh, deployment decision? For example, like a nuclear nuclear reactor or something like that, or the cloud example you use, trying to put some of these ICS systems in the cloud where previously you would always have to be at the plant logged into a computer to maybe interact with a nuclear reactor with a PLC that monitors status on a nuclear reactor. Are there, are, are there some systems like that that should never be exposed to the cloud, and how do we balance that flexibility from a policy perspective as a, as a, as a country? Yeah, yeah, so, at, I mean, for energy industry in particular, I'm, the answer to your question is yes, what we recommend is national level strategic warning, right? So, so you know, we call it in here National Supply Chain Intelligence Center. 
um, all source. Um, when we pivoted toward counterterrorism, um, we stood up NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, because there was inadequate information sharing and not strategic warning. And we were very, we were very afraid of not being able to connect the dots, right? Um, and that model really, really worked well. I sat there for a while, and you could see across everybody's intelligence, and we had everything from completely unclassified to exquisite sources from everywhere. The need for industry, because of why we're here today, talking about them getting warning and tying it to risk, because that's exactly right. Consequence is really what counts. And you, as an operator, knowing your customers are the only ones that can determine risk, or uh, yeah, total risk and consequence. Um, so we're really pushing for, um, and there's, there's increasing in interest in um, the, the ability in this domain to have national strategic warning that uses all source intelligence and goes all the way down to completely unclassified. So when you step into an airport and you're told you can't get on the plane because you're on the no-fly list, you know, that TSA agent has no idea why. They just know you're who you are. Um, but behind the scenes, there was a whole lot of intel that went on to, to make the determination that you're not in our best interest to let fly in our country. We need to do the same thing, some to, to your point, with industry, right? To say, you know, we know that that's economically attractive <laughs> to let that customer on your airplane. You know, we're going to say no or advise you to say no. And I think this is where the a relationship between the government and industry is really going to evolve. And, you know, we've, I think we've grown up in an era where government seemed to have the answer for everything. And I'm, I'm arguing I think that's going to kind of pivot. And, <laughs> and government is going to become increasingly, is becoming increasingly aware that actually, you know, they might have the answers and we need to listen to them, but we need to get them to the point where they own the problem with us. And it's not just one of, hey, I'm just here to make a nickel. That's what I really like about Mises' talk is, it's, you know, it's talking about, it's really not the money, it's the patient sitting there. Um, and as far as the sharing, uh, this kind of ties in. Um, I really started thinking that way a couple of years ago, interacting with the energy industry. So there is a lot of sharing, and it sounds like you guys are doing it in pharma. The energy industry is doing a lot of sharing amongst itself. There's a group that is very hard to even get into. Um, and it's because, and I had two C-suite people tell me, it's because we just don't trust the government. You guys can't keep a secret. It's either leaked because of politics or it's leaked because um, of uh, a, a, a bad actor that goes bad. And our business depends on us sharing your, our information with you. So, you know, yes, you can make them do that contractually. If they're under contract with the government, we can force them, and they do. Um, but the real model is, hey, why do we care? If they can make it safer, you know, and the energy companies getting together in their little group and, and sharing information amongst themselves, I see the same thing happening in the defense industrial base. You know, there's big actors in the DIB that are collaborating, even though they compete with each other with, for contracts, they all share with each other because we know, you know, they're all kind of interdependent. It's an interesting ecosystem, but, but I, I, I couldn't agree more. And even uh, companies that are not traditional defense industrial base entities are extremely serious about intrusions and security. Um, that's why you'll read in the news about um, Mill Cloud or the Department of Defense wanting to contract with Amazon Cloud Services because um, whether it's you know protection of data using blockchain or some other new technology. Um, this is this is big money for these big companies, Google or Amazon, Microsoft, and others, and so they take it so seriously that uh, they invest a lot of money in the development of new technologies that protect their products, and so you don't necessarily see the invention of these technologies coming from within government. Although oftentimes government will fund those efforts, you'll also see it growing organically within the commercial sector. So, uh, Dr. Purser, I just uh, take sort of moderator's prerogative here to ask, to ask a question. What, who is, is there a government belly button to own the supply chain problem? I know we have representatives of it. I know NCSC does some activities, but is, is, there, is there someone who, who owns that problem? Are, are we okay there? Do we need to do something more? I would what, say, what, what would you say? I would say there are a cadre of individuals, a small group that uh, assumes leadership in this area. One, um, obviously, is 
NCSC. National Counterintelligence Security Center. Uh, and also within Department of Defense, Manufacturing and Industrial Based Policy, MIBP, has a political head and uh, many federal employees who deal with industrial based issues. There, I'm sure there are other elements of the intelligence community, and I do know that those groups collaborate and talk. Uh, in terms of one specific belly button, I think that the problem is so complex and widespread that it would be difficult to point to, is it someone at DOD, is it someone within the Office of the Director of National Intelligence? I think it really depends, but that I do know that those groups collaborate. However, we are, you know, we do recommend in this report that we need a chain of command in every department agency for supply chain security, you know, and if you, I think, I was sitting in a FERC hearing, um, and it was several years ago, and I think, if I'm correct, um, Cisco was the first Fortune 500 company to appoint an officer of supply chain security. Not from a logistics standpoint. I mean, lots of companies have supply chain logistics people. But an officer of the company, but what happened? They had set up a manufacturing facility in Beijing and lost a lot of IP. And then they found counterfeit product being out in their customer base and them having to respond to counterfeit right. product. Right. So th I think that's, you know, taking a cue from them, it would, our recommendation is yes, someone in the department, maybe the vice chiefs, um, should be should be held accountable and that let them delegate it. But every department and agency, and increasingly private sector. I mean, you you have one, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 You you have to have responsibility. Yeah. You have to have clear chain of command and responsibility. I think it, when something is important. Yeah. Um, there was a question over here. My name is Steve Schiffer. I'm working with the NNSA right now on supply chain risk. Um, been there about five years now, and I've I've seen us come a long way in terms of collaborating with the DOD uh, from almost none to now it's, it's kind of shaky, but the <laughs> intelligence uh, communities are, are sharing information. Uh, You're getting there one step at a time, right? Uh, yes, yeah, slow steps. Uh, uh, I, I come from a background about 30 years with the automotive industry, uh, and um, what, what I'm, I'm, I'm used to seeing is, is like we have a senior VP of supply chain and if we, if we have a problem, if we need to harden our supply chain or to make it more resilient, we approach it from an enterprise standpoint. So this kind of goes against my, my DNA because there's, even within, you know, the NNSA is part of the DOE, even within the DOE, we're fragmented in our efforts in supply chain. And there's some areas that are very good, and there's some areas that are downright scary. Um, <coughs> and. We're, we're, we're duplicating efforts, we're, we're you know, uh, I think we're, we're spending more resources than we need to to get the job done. Uh, and I see that within the DOD as well for the, you know, the contact that I've had. My question for the, for the panel is, do you see any appetite within the federal government to, to at least take some key areas and, and approach it from more of an enterprise standpoint? I think you should send an anonymous note to Mick Mulvaney. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have the email, uh, Dr. Purser? <laughs> um, yes. Appreciate your question and comment. Just so you know, and for the record, NNSA and the Department of Energy, we're part of this consortium that deal with trusted and assured microelectronics for the government. And I will, will also say, tongue in cheek, that the collaboration, I see a, a, a direct um, relationship between the collaboration between NNSA and DOD that is linked to the requirement of funds from, N from DOD by NNSA. <laughs> I see much more collaboration now that NNSA takes DOD money for operations, for things that DOD needs. So um, I would say... It's all the blue I, team, right? I, I don't have a lot of insight in Department of Energy's relationships, although I'm not surprised to hear about it. And in fact, um, what I do know about DO, DOE is that whether it's um, radioactive material for medical products uh, is quite a different, you know, set of communities from, you know, nuclear weapons. And you wouldn't think that they are, but 
you know, I've worked in, in similar communities and they, are not, they do not overlap. So that could lead to some of that stovepiping that you'll see in other places in government as well. Um, I don't see the extent of that issue at DOD uh, from my time there and from where I was in the Office of Secretary of Defense, I could see across um, the, uh, the different communities there. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. Everybody loves to talk about stovepiping at DOD, but I think that there are many concerted efforts to re reduce it there. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So uh, I wanted to give the general a chance to, to weigh in. You've been sitting here thinking in, and taking in what people have been saying. Do you have any, any comments to add? No, not, not uh, really. I want to thank the, uh, the panel and also the people who have asked the questions. It seems to me that uh, if you're going to do business with, uh, with the government, not just the Department of Defense, but with the government, then uh, large or small, uh, you should have a, uh, a supply chain security program. And if you don't, you don't get any contracts. I mean, I would just make it that way. Uh, no question about it. I don't care whether it's a two or three man outfit or if it's uh, what Mike uh, described in terms of the infrastructure, you either have it or you don't. And not only that, but you meet the, the high standards that are demanded uh, for security. You're never, in my humble opinion, ever going to have 100% security. Uh, you need to go for the 80% rule and hope that that's good enough to win. I also think that uh, maybe we can learn some lessons from the old days. Uh, in the old days, for example, in electronic warfare, we had uh, electronic warfare, and when we developed a system, uh, we, uh, we immediately had a group of experts look at electronic countermeasures. We had in another room, if you will, or another building, a group of, uh, of men and women who were experts in electronic counter countermeasures. <laughs> And so when we, you know, we developed a radar, uh, we immediately had people figuring out how to defeat that radar or uh, capitalize on it, et cetera. That was what ELINT's really all about and so on and so forth. So the point I want to make is uh, we ought to really go back to thinking about uh, some of these things and make it really, really tough. High standards, uh, red team. Why don't we red team this more often? Why don't we have a group of experts that get in there and red team both the uh, the private sector and the public sector, and red team them from their o for their own good because it's for their own good that they do it right the right way. I think too that uh, I think that the government ought to have a kind of a gung ho pro program here that sort of you know, encourages everybody to to uh, to, to want to win, and 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 so on. Uh, may sound old-fashioned. Maybe the uh, maybe the econ economy idea is just too strict, and there are no longer any patriots out there. Uh, I happen to think there are. I happen to think that when uh, push comes to shove, there's a hell of a lot of good people in this country, both in the industry and in the private sector and the public sector, and I think. Uh, uh, in the young people, the young people that are out there today, I think there's a lot of good there too. They're different. Uh, you have to educate them differently uh, because they learn differently and we have to give up some of our old fashioned ideas and get with it. But I think, uh, you know, we tend to be kind of pessimistic in these kind of programs because we see all the bad things that are going to happen and I think we ought to be a little bit optimistic and we also have to be tough. If you don't do it right, you uh, you shoot them in the leg and watch them roll around on the ground. You know what I mean? Uh, we got to get tough about this thing. Ouch. Well, I mean, yeah, that's just a, an example. <laughs> Figure of speech. So thank you, thank you. I, that's uh, uh, tremendous. I mean, it's uh, really words that we'll remember. You know. Well, well the one thing he really hit on that is really vital is the counter countermeasures. I use that as an example yeah. because Wait. it is not a static adversary. No, no. Right? That's I why we got to go beyond I compliance. I and in our efforts, every once in a while, we get and we get to speak to people who who do that kind of thing, who do yeah. deliberate red teaming. Not a lot, but and and we, we it's amazing the vul how vulnerable yeah. some systems are when a, and when a red teamer is is yeah. set loose. We ought to go it wasn't back hard. To I didn't even have to try. Let's go back to using something was mentioned, high frequency. 
uh, go back to being analog about uh, your thought process and a lot of these yep. domains. Uh, think about restoration and resilience. You know, we used to, uh, in, in the old days, for example, when you went aboard a flagship, for an amphibious flagship, for example, or a fleet flagship, there were 68 uh, communication circuits that they were capable of being in on and the like. And of those 68, they were all important, but there were eight or 10 that were vital. And so therefore, when you had a restoration plan, you restored those eight or 10 right away. And I remember uh, having a lot of problems with the Navy. I had to get some of the Marine circuits involved in that first uh, eight or 10. <laughs> uh, but, uh, that took a little different kind of persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of thought process yeah. we ought to have. Yeah, it's a war. It's just a silent war. Yeah, well, it's different. Yeah. It, it's a different kind of war. It, yeah. It's a different kind of war and than and when and I was uh, I mean, young. They're going to do it. it. It's just like, uh, it, you know, it's just like the terrorist thought process. You know, to have a war against terrorism is, is dumb. I mean, that's a tactic. It's a technique. It's been around since the Quran, the Bible, and whatever else. <laughs> and it's what people do when they don't have the kinds of capability that you have and, and so on. We did it in the Revolutionary War in the Carolinas, if you look, you know, and so on. Uh, so, I mean, you know, uh, so, so the point I want to make, this is, these are the kind of things people are going to do now, and, and they're on top of it. And, of course, I could make a whole new afternoon speech on, on the information warfare and how that fits yeah, into it yeah. and so on. But this is all part of it. It's all part of the process. And, uh, and we are... Uh, we're not as up to speed as we should be mm. if we're going to intend to to win for the free world. We have we have a, a different arena today than than the Cold War between like two major adversaries. It's it's like you said they don't want to take us on kinetically. And I would say, yeah, we worry about you know progress of China and Russia, but kinetically there's it's still not good for them to take us on kinetically. Yeah, so they're going to look at other. Even that this this quote return back to peer to peer. What happens when the peers use what you're talking about? Right, yeah. And so they're going to do it. That's, well, so in here we talk about, you know, that it, so General Mattis has talked about the changing character of war, right? If you've gone out and read about it, he said, I always thought it would never change, and now I'm rethinking that. Um, it's why it's in the title. And our argument in here is that because of this asymmetric era, our adversaries, and it's full spectrum, private sector and public, that they can stop, if not reverse, the decision cycle. So when we were bombing Syria not too long ago, <coughs> what if the response, just imagine that those homes in Andover that were blown up, which I knew instantly had to be pressure, right? And the first thing I thought, hmm, this could be cyber. It could be an attack against the gas distribution sensor, right? It's, an, it's the layer, right? So all you got to do is tell the PLC, hey, the sensors are saying I need pressure. Boom, I increase the gas. So what if, what if that was happening in 50 cities across the United States? How long would it take before the president's decision cycle is not just stopped, but reversed and said, hang on, we got to figure out, and it's misattributed. So Russia's response to us is not only non-kinetic, but they make it look like it's ISIS doing it. Now go, and the, the infrastructure guy is nodding his head. It's not that hard. <laughs> That's exactly what we're talking about. Yeah, and it's happening now all the time, mm -hmm. which is, it's not like we're waiting for something to happen. Well, they, they have the capability and it's happening. So, so uh, we've had a pretty good uh, discussion. I, I want, I'll get to one final question. I will get to your question, Bob, but I, then I wanted to give everyone a chance for some final remarks, something that might have been prompted by the discussion that you wanted to leave the audience with. So, Bob, fi final audience question. Yeah, I, I appreciate the general's uh, commentary, offense or defense, and he said both. <laughs> Um, but we, you know, going back to the Cold War, it was mad, mutually uh, assured destruction. So when you speak about the silent war, rhetoric and retaliation, so I would perhaps think that maybe that would be more of an argument to concentrate, not forget about the defense for sure, but maybe some more concentration on our offensive capabilities. That is a question, actually. So, so um, that's troubling. Because I agree with you. I agree with you. If we want comprehensive deterrence, um, defense is part of it. Offensive is as well. I sat in the back row of the June 21 Hask hearing um, um, where Kerry Bingham and Mr. Griffin and uh, uh, Eric Tuning uh, testified before the Hask. And it was really interesting because the questions coming from the Hask were basically along the lines of, what do we have to do to stop this? You know, <laughs> how, 
The problem fundamentally at the highest level is we're still adhering to the Geneva Convention. The Geneva Convention says that even if a non-signatory country puts unarmed non-combatant citizens at risk, we will still respond according to international law, which means we will not do the same to them and we'll make it reversible. That's our official response. The only other option, that's called retorsion. The only other option is reprisal. That says, well, we won't pay attention to international law. It doesn't scale, it's covert action. It's plausible deniability, it doesn't scale. So if you really, really wanna attack that problem to build the offensive and fight back asymmetrically, then you need to re-look at our international agreements and update the Geneva Convention because that's, that's the root cause of it. No, and don't, don't laugh, we're, we're having conversations about that. Um, Mike Chertoff and Harvey Rishikoff and I had, but Mike works in a very international world and he's, he's very interested in taking that on. I agree, yeah. So, Dr. Mishra, any, any final comments? I mean, listening to the uh, general conversation, clearly, I work, we operate in a different space. Um, our problems, so to speak, are much more confined, not to not at the national level. But we have, you know, basically our own issues. And um, the question I asked about, you know, flu vaccine, there was a good question, can it be uh, counterfeited? Imagine there is a pandemic and we release the product to the market and it's all gone. That can, now you have a sudden run, basically a runaway reaction where it's gonna just uh, magnify and, and, and people are gonna die. So I think in, in general, what we are finding out is that a lot of the challenges to our supply chain is really coming from, um, and I don't mean to single out those countries, but generally from those countries that cannot afford these medicines. And so they're looking for other ways around it, either because actors are willing to just make money off of the backs of patients that they don't really care about. So it's, it's basically has, it's getting to be a point where now companies are starting to collaborate together through various initiatives to say, this is not just our, our problem or our product or our danger, it's everybody's problem, because patients' uh, lives are at stake. So I think, um, and we, uh, to a certain extent, I was talking to Chris, um, we also worry about some of these um, <clears throat> external attacks on our, on, on basically on our systems for manufacturing. So we have a program where we've uh, challenged a few of our own employees to go outside and see if they can hack into our system. And they've been able to hack in all the way down to the individual piece of equipment because it was connected to a PLC, a PLC is connected to SAP, and SAP does the, does the full ERP of our, of our manufacturing process. So again, we have to worry about those things as well. And I think in many ways, there are, there are opportunities there to collaborate and learn from the experts. Thank you. So Chris, any final words? Um, I would just say that it's also important to think about the motives of the adversaries, right? Whoever they are, it can be individual, you know, primarily nation state. Um, I. From what I can tell, there's really three main motives. And one is to collect um, steel IP. Remember when they steal it, it doesn't just disappear out of the drawer, they just copy it. <laughs> so it can be gone a long time before you ever know it. Yeah, tech transfers. Yeah, <laughs> uh, un unwilling tech transfers. A two is for intelligence collection. Um, just because they're in the system doesn't mean that they're there to destroy it. They might be there to see, well, what are you manufacturing? What's the recipe? Not to steal it, but to figure out, well, what is your technology? Collect intel. And the third may be to make you non-mission ready when you need to be mission ready, um, uh, directly or indirectly. Um, the only other thing I would say is um, we really need to address this with our allies. So with the whole offshoring problem, or uh, not problem, the, the, the mention, what we're talking here about is the adversaries. But we've got a lot of good allies out there, and those allies we're dependent on for certain key technologies in the, both the public and private sectors. What we're not paying too much, in, too much attention to is the body of entities, countries in between, the frenemies. 
you know, the people that might be right up against that ally line today and four years ago, four years from now, be, be over here. How do we identify them and, and keep track of, well, where is our policy and relationship going, but really start grabbing these uh, allies in. So along those lines, we're starting to do some wor uh, work with Wilton Park, um, because if we're compromised, our adversaries are compromised as well. So we're kind of heading out there. Thank you again, Potomac Institute, for the invitation today. It's been a pleasure. As I review in my mind the national security strategy and the national defense strategy that have both come out in the past year, uh, we have entered a, st a phase of sub-threshold warfare. In the past two decades, as the United States has, has focused on uh, defeating counterterrorism in, in the CENTCOM AOR, our near peers have been gaining an advantage. They've gained uh, an economic advantage, they've gained technical advantage, uh, and many others. And so when I say sub-threshold warfare, there have been attacks on our U.S.-based companies, on our military, um, and other systems in our government that are sub-threshold. In other words, they don't rise to the level of war, but they are nonetheless, in total, very, very damaging to our country. When you consider the theft of intellectual property at a very uh, broad scale, when you consider disinformation and propaganda campaigns, people don't use the term propaganda, but I think that that's something that's vital that we should resurrect as a term because it's very uh, persistent and it's everywhere now. Um, the insider threat is something that has not been discussed at all in this forum, and I think that it is extremely important and is an undercurrent of uh, the attacks on our businesses as well as our, uh, our government entities. Spoofing and other types of cyber warfare um, all lead to a, a very complex sub-threshold warfare and threat environment. All of this is fomenting a, a less perfect union of our United States. You know, our Constitution is based on us being a perfect, a more perfect union of states, where the East Coast and the West Coast believe that being together is important, that democracy is worth the trouble, um, that we should all be working together. And I would say that this sub-threshold warfare has contributed in part to the dissolution of our more perfect union. This is just Joy's opinion. Um, so, so does, you know, so in the eyes of other nations, uh, does democracy work? Uh, would it be better to have a strong man at the head who can just take everybody in the same direction and knit us all together? Or do we appreciate the differences in our, in our different states? Um, so I would say all of that is uh, at risk and to be considered. And um, thank goodness uh, for Potomac Institute and others discussing the global supply chain because I believe that it is an integral part of that uh, contributing to that threat. Thank you. So uh, General, thank you for your comments. Any other, any final uh, words of wisdom? You told me to shut up, is that the word you're <laughs> No sir, I would never do that. I would never presume to do that, General. No, I think again, uh, uh, it's been a, a great session. Thank you very much for, for coming here. And I just uh, just remember that, uh, you know, we have, haven't declared war since World War II. Maybe uh, we ought to give some thought to declaring war uh, against the people who have uh, indicated they're at war with us, not just, the, not just the terrorist idea, but some of this other stuff that's going on that, uh, that all three of you have literally alluded to both in the pharmaceutical side as well as the asymmetric thought process, as well as your overall experience here uh, uh, with, both, uh, with both the budget and now DOD. Uh, and you know, whenever you have a war, you need to know who the enemies are. And uh, we don't do a very good job of that. We, uh, we've really uh, ignored uh, who the enemy is in the case of the terrorist challenge. and. Uh, some of the other enemies here that are doing these kind of things, uh, never make any more enemies than you already have. 
and we want to be very careful about that. And that, that includes when we work uh, with our uh, allies and friends and those we're trying to bring on over to the other side. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of thought that has to go into it when you're actually at war. And maybe, uh, maybe we ought to do that. Maybe we ought to think more about that, put it on a wartime footing. Uh, that also gives you uh, more authority and less uh, reliance on regulatory type actions, which are always a pain in the neck, as everybody knows. It's in industry and the like. And, uh, and also, it, uh, when people do something wrong, uh, they have to be, uh, you know, they have to be taken care of. They should be uh, disciplined or whatever the legal aspect is, or if you want to turn them over to me, I can take care of it too. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, th thank you all for uh, uh, what I think has been a great session. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and especially, uh, thank you for your participation. I, I didn't really have to, I didn't have to bore you with all the questions I wrote down. So thank you for being very vigorous participants. We're generating products, so this isn't just sitting here and talking. We're going to generate products about what we've learned from this. The first one, as Chloe, I think, already showed, is that we have a 5G product, but we're also generating output from the previous uh, workshops that we've had and what people have learned from each other on supply chain security, people who live in very different parts of the problem. So thanks again for your attendance and especially your participation. I think he pulled a sweat in him. He pulled a sweat in him.